Another series introduction, I think. <clears throat> just call these maybe science videos. Um, this is really just, you know, talking out of the ass kind of stuff. Um, a lot of it will be, I think. Um, just kind of thoughts on physics and biology and chemistry, whatever. Those basic stuff. Um, because, you know, some of this stuff is important because there are a whole lot of theories out there that are based on interpretations of science that um, I think are kind of dubious <laughs> so um, it's worth talking about but some of it's got to be I guess explained before we can eliminate a gap that people are shoving a god into um, and uh, it's interesting regardless <laughs> even if it had no purpose it's still interesting to pursue um, understanding on these kind of subjects all right so the first one on evolution was something that popped in my head a few weeks ago um, you know, it was related to one of the nature videos I did, because that's when I first started to wonder about it, just because I was curious about how funguses don't take over the world. I mean, it is it is such a simple biology. Um, they can live on almost, I mean, they don't, they, you know, it's, it's they're, they're not very demanding, let's put it that way. Um, certainly a fungus in one patch of ground could probably just as well, you know, three meters away on another patch of ground. Um, but they don't do it, okay? They don't just cover the ground. They just don't sit there and spread all over the place, generally speaking. Especially these very eccentric funguses. Um, you know, I don't know the names of them, but there was that one giant big, you know, basketball fungus, and then there's these bright orange funguses that you'd only see in certain places on a certain piece of wood at a certain time. Um, and uh, so in thinking about it, I mean, the, you know, I, I was trying to come up with an explanation. Well, why? Why does it, why is something that's creating all these spores that's still, you know, it has in it the same DNA kind of um, mission, you know, let's just take over. I mean, it is a colony. It isn't an organization. It isn't an organism. But why wouldn't that colony just intend to, sp why wouldn't it just spread all over? And so um, I sort of came to the conclusion that over billions of years of evolution, those an animals that did that were probably rejected. I mean, they're always animals always had to have built into them defense mechanisms against being prey. Um, being prey is a bad idea. You don't want to be so prevalent in the environment that any other organisms finds it um, advantageous to evolve as something that lives off of you, or on you, or through you, um, that's not going to be to your advantage. Uh, so you want to have some limit on how plentiful you become. Because if you don't, uh, and if you don't have some real a mechanism to, to prevent you becoming exterminated by that fact, because once they find a way to thrive on you, you might not be able to react quickly enough with some toxin or some other biological mechanism to deter that um, destruction, and you will be exterminated, <laughs> you know, eliminated, you know, eradicated. And you sort of see that with invasive species, um, you know, on that are introduced to an island or something where animals have evolved a certain way, and then something is introduced um, foreign and it pretty much wipes out all the native population I mean it can basically create or cause an extinction and we can tell from the fossil record that there's been lots and lots and lots of extinctions and some of them might have been based on this fact um, that you just can't be too successful um, because you, it's dangerous and so I was even thinking about things like grasses and how they really have evolved over time to compensate for that fact. I mean, they can spread and grow and become a very um, um, successful um, part of the biosphere uh, because they're they've you know got a mechanism to protect themselves um, that they basically know have built into them this this idea of yeah we'll give the predators what they want. Um, you know, and keep your keep the core of your life, keep your heart <laughs> away from them. You know, the roots. Um, and uh, but anyway, it's just something that popped in my head, and so I thought it was worth mentioning, just because I think it sort of does explain why um, 
most organisms have built into them some kind of limitation. I mean, obviously, it's it's also to your disadvantage to be, you know, all over the place, consume all the food there is um, too quickly, because then you also threaten your capacity to reproduce into the future because you will consume all there is for your species to consume you know whatever niche environment you're living on and that's the other mechanism that's sort of deterring too rapid a spread um, but I don't think that, that itself would explain rareness I think rareness is more of a defense against becoming a food source if you stay rare enough, nothing's going to really evolve. None of these successful organisms are going to evolve to find you um, become dependent on your existence. Uh, so then you can sneak by without worrying about being predated into extinction. All right, the second one was the uh, physics thing, light again, and the fabric of the universe. And so I've been thinking through that more and more. And... Um, so I was thinking of, of terminology or a way to look at it and um, you know this photon thing if we just called if we just thought of it as not even so much a thing but just whatever a, a, a tick you know a, a, a bit of space you know this little cube of space and there are all these cubes of space connected to each other and that's what the whole fabric of space is made out of these cubes and that the speed of light is just the the time it takes for, for one, you know, side A of a cube and side B of a cube. So that would be the transition, whether the cube flips or whether the cube, whatever the cube does, that would be the time it takes for one cube to do what it is. That would be a tick of time. Um, and then if we think of that Einstein stretched space kind of stuff, and it's so hard to do because all you have is these, all you can really do is visualize a two-dimensional model. It's very hard to you know, turn into three dimensions of fabric. I mean, that's, you know, that really challenges the brain. <clears throat> so, but if we just think of these cubes as being expandable and contractible, and that any, you know, that, that density, you know, or mass in this space would be a stretching of the space. So it, it would be essentially the same as what Einstein is saying, in that the space becomes longer. So. Einstein was basically saying if you had mass, what you did was you were like a weight and you stretched space. Um, and and I, I'm making the same argument, but I'm without the without putting into the model the sinking part and just saying it's a stretch of space. So what you're basically doing is when you gain mass is you're pulling on space. So you're creating the same effect. So the ticks are still ticks, but now they're longer. So the cubes of space when you when you gain mass you are stretching the space near you within whatever um, atmospheres of whatever ticks of your existence out you stretch that space so light appears to still move the same speed but the ticks themselves are now larger so that's a way of looking at it so that it, it sort of accounts for the space-time dimension thing so when you're existing on say this massive body you're existing in a time dimension where ticks are actually bigger so time is in a sense slowed down for you compared to the re real world or the the, the non-stretched world um, by the same token I guess it would be compression would be the opposite so every time you're moving you could argue that the space in front of you you are compressing and the space behind you you are expanding so the ticks are getting longer behind you and they're getting shorter in front of you um, for whatever like I said I can't say how far out all these these influences go but let's say that's the rule for all matter that the photon is the tick and then everything built on top of that is some compression or expansion of a tick um, and mass would I think obviously have to be a compression where the where you get that bent space effect so all mass is a, 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 comp a stretching of space and all movement is creating a compression of space and uh, so but anyway so I haven't thought out the whole dynamic because we have to consider our relative movements so you have to add up all our movements within this structured ticks of cubes of space 
because we have not only the rotation of the planet and then our movement around the sun and then the the entire um, solar system's movement within the galaxy and so you have all these you know you have to add up all these different um, compressions and you know these compressions and stretching of the cubic space that we are functioning in to be able to to fully understand exactly what dimension of time and space we are existing in or how much compression and how much expansion we're living in and how we're so that's sort of the space we're seeing the rest of the world through is that we're we're seeing or we're it's interacting with us through a lot of stretched and contorted time space dimensional bullshit the cubes are bigger and smaller um, based on all our different um, effects on the on the fabric the space fabric so anyway, just something's been rolling through my head. I haven't got it. I'll have to draw a picture or something.